Without further ado, then, thank you, uh, Richard Park, for uh, doing this first webinar for us. We're trying to salvage something out of the mini conference we were going to have at the end of March. And uh, yeah, we're going to continue like this every other week going forward, as long as we can get people to talk. So I'll hand over to Richard now. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or whatever. Um, this first one is something I ran as an evening session at Dialogue 19, but for technical reasons that video wasn't released, so I get to reuse the content, which is nice for me. But it also means that it's um, a nice, easy start to these, nothing too intense. So, I mean, if you do want to take notes, you can get a pen and paper out. Uh, you can start by you can start by writing all of this down. No, not really. Um, this talk is titled uh, Molecular Dynamics in Dialog APL. And that's one of those, another one of those big scary words that sounds complicated, but it's not really. Um, molecular Dynamics is a set of sort of phys physics simulations um, where we want to model atomic and molecular systems uh, using most of the time it's classical mechanics so we're literally just solving Newton's equation uh, trying to for find the accelerations on some on some atoms uh, there is quantum molecular dynamics but this that's far beyond the scope of this talk which is very a very surface simple introduction um, before I show you the framework I've set up for sort of playing with these things in APL. So here you've got the sort of famous F equals MA version. And there's also um, this derivative of a potential version for a potential V, which is like the potential energy between two atoms, for example. Uh, this equation can be solved. Now, it's kind of uh, straightforward if you've just got two atoms or something like that, you can analytically solve and get a closed form equation. But for anything more than that, we're basically dealing with a many body problem. So you can't solve the differential equation. So we use a class of numerical integrators to step from, from state to state using some numerical approximations. And one of the most common ones, and the one that I've implemented for this is called the velocity burlet scheme and uh, this is uh, fairly fast it conserves energy for a closed system which is something you definitely want um, in a physics simulation it's also used by a lot of game engines so for video games but it's also used in uh, molecular dynamics proper quite quite commonly um, so you know, big, big computationally intensive simulations of, of sort of atomic systems. Um, I have talked about this before a couple of times. As I said, there was the Dialogue 19 a user meeting talk, which this is basically the same content. Um, there's also a webinar where I sort of step through some of the code, and it's also an open source project, somewhat unfortunately, because it's in a bit of a state the project at the minute, but this is where you can go to find all of the code that I'll show you today. And um, so really the, so that's the introduction to molecular dynamics. We're just solving equations and we're going to simulate some atoms. Um, in terms of using APL to do this, I found, you know, Link was behaving quite nicely when I did this. All of my stuff is in all of my source code is in text files which is fairly modern for apl and uh so that's how i can integrate nicely with my github project there um there's also obviously a fair amount of maths translating mathematical formulae which apl is pretty good at um using arrays to represent the state that i'm still in sort of i think i want to revise the way i do this when i if i develop this further um, and there's also a nice little neat, of, neat use of operators that I'll show you as well. So like higher order functions. 
to step through the simulation. So in terms of link and using text files, I like developing with text files and it allows me to use GitHub, yada, yada. Um, and this is just how we can load the project into the workspace in Dialog. Um, but there's also the fact that in the sort of, uh, the major molecular dynamics codes, which are used in industry, one's called LAMPS, um, and there's another one called HOOMED, if that's how you pronounce it. And they both basically abstract over all of the simulation code. Um, and you just, as a user, write a text file script in LAMPS, they're called .in, and HOOMED lets you basically do it in Python. Um, and that's how you sort of, you know, declare all of your constants and variables and set all of the initial positions and velocities and set everything up. What forces do you want between everything? Um, what's the particular, I, I mentioned velocity burlet, you can choose which particular integrator you want, for example, and that's all done in like a text script. So I decided to follow suit. Um, and I've, my, my version is these, are these dot apple fizz scripts and they're literally just straight APL statements one after the other. Um, I'll show you an example in a bit, a couple of examples, and you just sort of set it up in a text file about the A big, and then you click go and it starts simulating. Um, so part of this, as I said, the maths, here's uh, the potential function. So this is like the potential energy between uh, atoms at a distance R from each other. And this is a fairly simplistic model, but it's something you learn undergraduate physics, um, where you have like a, a sort of attractive force at long range. That's your, uh, can I control click? Sigma and R to the six. And then at short range to stop atoms from literally being on top of each other, you have this uh, repulsive force. Um, and it and you can see it codes quite nicely in APL. That's kind of why I bring that up. Uh, anything else to say about this? Not really. It's just translating mathematical formulae. Uh, as you go deeper into molecular dynamics codes, as you saw on uh, the second slide, the the sort of um, integrators and the potentials, and um, there are these bits of the code called thermostats, which sort of simulate a heat bath. Um, those get very long and tedious to code, but um, you know it's no worse than the maths itself when you code it in APL, which is quite nice. Uh, another really nice thing that came out of this um, when I was getting to modeling some some three D stuff, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, is sometimes when you're coding APL, you get like really nice um, expressions, especially with trains here, that quite nicely mirror the actual traditional mathematical notation definition. So this is the component of a vector uh, in the direction of another vector. And it just comes out quite succinct, succinctly with, um, okay, B hat is coded as this normalization, and then there's a dot product, and that's basically it. Um, I thought that was pretty cute. I, I originally coded this as uh, some kind of slightly uglier defen, and then Adam Brzezewski actually is the one who, who pointed out to me, he said, you need to learn to see the trains. And I did a webinar on, on trains recently, a few months ago for, for dialogue, and I have, I have started to internalize them, but at this, at this time it was, it was fairly new to me. I didn't really know what I was doing as much, but it did come up quite nicely. Um, so I quite like that. There's of course arrays, so everything, all data are arrays in APL, and um, it's quite handy for sort of having all my position, all of, all of my position vectors. In this case, I've done as so each row here represents the position of an atom in three-dimensional space. And one of the nice things of having this representation is if I want to do a two-dimensional uh, simulation, I just have a two by n matrix instead of, sorry, an n by two matrix instead of an n by three one. Um, and similarly for the velocity and acceleration, I can have a similar 
kind of arrays like this. And it, and it works quite nicely, I think. Um, there ends up being some performance sort of concerns when you approach um, everything as these sort of vectors in that. So one of the things that you have to do is in, in a sort of naive uh, implementation is calculate the um, displacement between any two given atoms for your whole system of atoms, which could be, you know, in, in the in the hardcore stuff, it's millions. So um, a statement like this, which is the outer product subtract selfie, and we split our position matrix into a nested vector of vectors and subtract every position from every other position. Um, now you're using nested arrays and it gets quite inefficient. Um, so people have pointed out to me, and I've started to learn how to use uh, the rank operator to keep everything flat. And this uh, particular um, version of it allowed really significant speed ups. It sort of went from being almost unusable to actually quite usable in the state that it is now. Um, just in terms of the, the speed of everything, speed of the calculations. So you can sort of play with things um, and see the output, which I'll show you how, how, how I've done that in a minute. And if you want to adjust something, you're not waiting years and years to get your results out, which is something it's, that's basically part and parcel of, of molecular dynamics is you set up your code, you set up your script with your parameters, you know, where are all the atoms, where, what are the forces, you know, initially, uh, and then you click go and you just sort of wait for ages and hope for the best. Uh, so the faster you can get the code, then obviously you, you don't have to wait to find out you don't have to wait too long to find out you've messed something up completely and gotten some completely silly results, which happens all the time. Um, I also want to mention this uh, funky use of the power operator. So you have your previous state, which is um, previous, and that consists of my position matrix and velocity matrix and acceleration, and then some uh, scalars, which um, represent sort of macroscopic properties like the uh, average potential energy and the average kinetic energy and the temperature and the pressure of the system. And if you make sure that your um, code that takes, you know, the, the system from one state to the next uh, in, has as inputs and outputs the exact same uh, format, then you can quite nicely use the power operator to skip over a bunch of steps or calculate through a load of steps and say you just want the output every hundred steps instead of every step, then this is one way to sort of code that really neatly. So I quite enjoyed that as well. So there are some neat things I learned on the way doing this um, in terms of just getting the numbers out and uh, how to make the code at least somewhat performant. Um, but I also was very keen to uh, get some images, get some movies going, because I don't know I like uh, visual stuff, uh, um, visual art, but also you know visualizations of, of physical phenomena and such stuff like that. So um, I created a my site using my server, and uh, I have tried this. Well, I won't guarantee that it's all going to be super smooth if you do it right now, um, where the exact same stuff works with Dewey, because Dewey is kind of the, um, the successor to my server. And using HTML5 Canvas, I think initially I had this um, ridiculous setup where, um, I mean, it worked because browsers are these strangely efficient uh, graphic processing engines uh, that companies have pumped a lot of money into making them shockingly efficient for what they are. Um, I had a bunch of HTML B tags which had images attached and I would just pipe the positions at every step um, to the web page and use that to adjust the positions of the HTML B tags and literally have them flying around the screen like that. 
Um, it's much more efficient. I think it's really, yeah, significantly more efficient to use HTML5 Canvas. So um, I'm going to show you my visualization sort of thing. I called it MyFizz because it's a My Server site for Apple Fizz. And it looks like this. Uh, can everyone see that clearly enough? I hope so. Um, it looks like this. So this is this is a text area that has my Apple Fizz script. And as you can see, it's just plain old APL, except I've obviously added a few abstractions in terms of how you would set up uh, the simulation. Although, uh, in principle, you can sort of code all the stuff directly in here. And especially because APL is so terse, it's not actually that terrible to do it. So if I click run the script, I've got some JavaScript stuff that, that handles all the, all the visuals, um, including setting the size of this little window. So I could even change that because it takes it from the, from the box size. I'm going to 30 by 40 here. And this is literally just saying, okay, um, periodic is I want periodic boundary conditions. And what that means is that if I have an atom, if it goes out one side of the box, it will reappear on the other side. So this is like the game of snake or um, the classic the classic John Skull's game of life APL example. We've, we've got life on a torus here. Um, so yeah, that's... That's why that is that. Delta T is the time step. Um, fixed temp, as I mentioned thermostats very briefly earlier. Um, they're basically simulating a heat bath, keeping the system at a constant temperature. Otherwise, everything goes wild. Uh, also, that's how you sort of match your simulations to physical, uh, real experiments, which will have some kind of uh, heat bath set up or something like that. Uh, create the atoms in random positions. I've got an optimized and an unoptimized version, which is basically like the uh, nested outer product versus the rank one, rank one ninety nine thing you saw before. Uh, and then my thermostat. Anyway, by now I should be able to start it. It looks pretty fun, right? At least I like it. Um, there are some strange and unphysical effects. Uh, the way that these things glue together isn't actually super physical. You end up with these things that are called, um, it's called the flying iceberg effect. And it's to do with the way that this very simplistic thermostat, you know, numerical thermostat works. It's not, it's not actually a physical effect. Um, I can do, so I can show you things like if I, turn the dump frequency down and that's the sort of end steps in the in the power thing the sort of statement with the power operator i showed earlier so if i run the script there you can see everything kind of in slow motion like this um there are other not so yeah so like i said the, the parameters aren't that good everything kind of uh glues together in a weird way, but that's this that's this number here, um, which is basically the bottom of the potential well. Basically, basically says how, you know how how sticky are these atoms. So if I run it, having decreased that number, then the overall sort of look is a bit more like billiard balls and a bit less like sticky things. Anyway, so that's some things you can play around with, um, which is quite fun, and that's how I sort of did the simulation in 2D. But as I said way earlier, you can also uh, just add an extra dimension onto your matrices and, and simulate in 3D. So I wanted to visualize that as well. And I went and found a JavaScript library for doing 3D rendering called Babylon. And Babylon.js is in this tab. And one thing that's really nice is Okay, there's some stuff here, which I can't remember if I need or not, and I am quite afraid of getting rid of it. It's basically the exact same code setup. I've added an extra dimension uh, when I do my create box, which sort of defines the space um, and defines the number of dimensions. But otherwise, it's all the exact same code underneath. Um, because some of the heavier 
um, simulations use, you know, have um, take much longer. I, I have this little counter to tell you how many how many simu simulation steps have been loaded. But this is the exact same thing, but in three D. So that's quite fun. Um, I can do things like if I tack on another atom. Uh, hopefully that works. And oops, I I am I'm sort of winging this one a bit. I I did try this a a bit earlier, but I'm trying to remember the exact things I needed to do. Uh, so we want to make sure this is up here. Okay. N atoms is the new tally of the positions. Um, our groups can get an extra one. And fix groups is basically say if it's a zero, then this group of atoms can move, and if it's a one, then they can't move. And aha, you can see it. Okay, um, and this is the way that I, I the first way I tried to implement uh, walls so that I could have like um, you know some kind of capsule to hold in my atoms. And in order to distinguish things, I, I implemented this little color changer. That's the real reason I wanted to show you this because I have. This first group of atoms, which is all the ones flying around, you can see, and then the second group just has one atom, and I can change the color of the balls, which is <laughs> it's just fun, um, but also quite useful for visualization. So that's how I do stuff in 2D and 3D, and it all works basically the same. Um, now, where for this bit, I think we're there. Yep. I'm now going to show some uh, movies that I have pre rendered because um, I wanted to show a particular physical effect so that I could have something really tangible um, and sort of familiar to show people. Um, and for this bit, when I ran it in uh, Elsinore Dialogue 19, I am not saying that I did play uh, some copyrighted music out loud to the audience, but if I had, then the YouTube link that's now in the chat would be the, the music that I'd played because it's, uh, it just gives a nice aesthetic. So I invite you now, if if you if you want to, um, you can go ahead and play this while I play some movies and sort of talk about more simulations. So this is in, here we go. Um, and it's quite likely, I suppose, that there'll be adverts and such. So I can right now at least tell you about what I was going for. Uh, when I when I did a bunch of these simulations. So what I showed you just now was the uh, simple Leonard Jones um, molecular dynamic simulation with really simplistic reef. It, the thermostat literally just multi has a uh, multiplier for the velocities that keeps the, the temperature constant. And it's super simplistic, but also I, I did a few things to make the implementation faster so that I could do the stuff that you just saw where I sort of play around with the simulation a bit and it all renders very quickly. Um, but for the effect that I wanted to show at Dialogue 19, I um, which is called, it's called the Brazil nut effect. Uh, and it's because it's basically I guess if you have Brazil nuts, which are quite large in a bucket full of smaller nuts, it works. Uh, but it also works if you have like some large Lego blocks or some Duplo in a bucket full of Legos and you shake them around. And basically if, you're, if you've got a bucket full of sand and some nuts at the bottom, if you're shaking that, agitating that box uh, a lot, then you'll find that the large particles float towards the top. 
And so I had to implement this other model, which, had a, which is called the granular model. And so in the, in the Leonard Jones one uh, that I had earlier, it didn't, the, the atoms are basically infinitesimal. You don't really consider their physical size, whereas these are, um, these are more like macroscopic part, you know, particles you might be able to actually see. And so you have to also account for friction between them um, and other things. And so I kind of put that one together and it doesn't have any of the same optimizations. Um, so it's much, much slower to run. So the idea here is I've got um, five uh, infinite idealized planes as my walls. And they're represented by these sort of green planes. Um, they're, even, for, the, for the sake of being able to see it, I've cut them off. But in terms of their effect, they're, they're modeled as being infinite uh, planes. So there's just a kind of tube here. And the bottom has got like a sine function moving it up and down. And that's what's sort of throwing all of the, um, throwing all of the balls up and down. So I guess this is me uh, giving up a little bit or deciding it's not going to work that well. Some of the, I haven't looked that deeply into it, but some of the research around this is quite interesting because uh, people have gone as far as um, calculating the force networks between all of these things to try and sort of pin down exactly why the large things float, you know, they don't float, but you know, get sifted towards the top. Um, I think I saw one paper that claimed that so they had like, um, in their simulation, they had a, a friction that was toggleable. You could turn the friction on and off. And they have a couple of videos there that sort of show that if the friction is off, then you don't get this effect. Everything sort of stays, even though it's bouncing up and down, everything stays where it, where it belongs or <laughs> where it started. Uh, and if you turn the friction on, then you get this effect. more of that let's see uh, another one I guess so I, I, I've labeled this one Brazil nut and I believe that this one uh, demonstrates the effect Look at that, he made it all the way to the top. Incredible. One more time for the people at the back. So trying different colors, different perspectives. Okay, so one thing um, 
that yeah, like I said, you have to be careful, and it's quite nice having a ver- having a, um, a framework where you can try things out sort of quickly and iterate a, a lot because uh, if you if you if you do the setup wrong, you get <laughs> you get some really strange effects. So, so, so I don't know what I can't explain this. Um, <laughs> it's crazy, huh? Wonderful. I do like it, yeah. Don't you think it's 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 quite pretty? Oh look at it go. <laughs> I like that one. I mean this is this is also part of my um sorry, I'm gonna have to mute you, Peter, because I think my voice is coming through. Oh, maybe I can't. Uh, one of the things that really appeals to me about about this kind of stuff, I love sort of one of the things that um, was really great when you first sort of start learning to program is sort of making things come to life just through your sort of the incantations. Uh, so visualization has always been a strong part for me. Uh, I don't know if anyone is aware of... Uh, I can't remember the guy's name, sorry. The uh, guy who did OK, which is an uh, open source implementation of K. And he has a really nice um, thing called IKE. It's in a similar vein, I mean, it's a bit more geared towards pure graphics, but it lets you code in K and you have a little, I think it's a canvas as well next to you. Um, that draws what you code, and, and his one's much more versatile. Oh my god, look at that! His is much more versatile, it lets you basically render any uh, bitmap image. So you just write the code to generate the bitmaps, and then you render it, and off you go. That's really cool. I'd like to have something similar to that, but for APL for teaching. That's another thing, right? I mean, it's as an interpreted language, APL is pretty fast. Um, as they go. For some things it's very, very fast, but because of the way that the industry codes have been engineered, um, then I think we're still a bit slower. So, Stephen? I can't quite hear you if you're trying to ask something. Not sure. Uh, this one I've titled "Air," so anything could happen. Actually, that's probably because it's rubbish, isn't it? it probably means it was lame. Sorry, yes, this part of the. Uh, of the webinar is just you watch me play with my balls for a bit. I'm sorry about that. Thank you though. <laughs> okay, this one didn't quite do it. So it's been about uh, 35 minutes since I started yammering on now. So I think um, I'll kind of wrap up the, the talky bit and you can have a conversation if you want. In terms of, so, um, so I'd say I haven't really touched this since the last, uh, since I was getting everything ready for showing it in Elsinore and I kind of uh, hacked together those last examples, which is why they're, like I said, they're significantly slower 
uh, than the ones I've tuned a bit more. Um, so there is still the exact same amount of work to be done uh, on this project if I want to sort of clean it up uh, and make it more ready for consumers. Um, yeah, the, the GitHub repository is a bit of a mess. It's not well documented or anything like that. So when I get some, when I get some time, whenever that may be, um, I'll, I'll clean up this mess. Uh, in terms of speed, obviously this is the domain of, of, of high performance code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tony. Uh, uh, I think when I, I did that, it was way it was it was way smoother in Elsinore, but I was also slightly more drunk, so maybe that's something to do with it. Or maybe I'm funnier then. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is this is sort of a domain of, of really high performance code on high performance computers, and um, even the parallelization of it involves sort of doing message passing between different cores and stuff. But I think I will, um, when I take this further, it will be something uh, where, I, where I try and, I think I'm gonna basically rewrite the thing from scratch so that it works nicely with code defense and hopefully we can get some of their um, most intensive bits running compiled and or on a GPU. Um, but obviously it is a sort of iterative thing inherently. So that kind of puts your bottleneck in there. So um, I need to find a way, I need to find a way to have stuff stay on the GPU or stay in the cache and keep running. There's lots of ways I think this can be sped up. Um, I'd also considered scalability, like I said, the, the industry codes, they parallelize using message passing between these like, uh, you know, thousand core high performance computers. Uh, but, and I've since thought maybe exploring isolates isn't really going to give me that much of a benefit um, because they send um, messages through TCP to parallel workspaces. And I think that's just going to be too costly in the end, but it's something that could be done. Um, the way that you do, this was asked when I gave it before, the way you do parallelization, because it is obviously a state full sort of simulation paradigm, is you break up your volume of stuff into these chunks, into these little boxes, and you sort of give each box to a different processor. Um, where the atoms within a box will ignore all the other ones except for the atoms on the kind of border on the boundary you sort of pass the positions um when you need to update and then there are other things like instead of uh calculating the relative displacements of all the atoms every time you keep a neighbor list of the nearest neighbors and based on statistical properties and things like how how long does it take for atoms to get a new set of nearest neighbors you can cut down the computation a lot doing stuff like that um yeah lo loads of the research is, as always with performance critical things is just reducing the number of computations you have to do but still maintaining um a sort of useful physical level of uh, accuracy. Um, in terms of the GUI, there were loads of things that I want to do with this as well. So maybe you could download rendered videos. Um, I think I did screen cap for the other things. Um, since it's literally just a, a big list of position matrices, you could, in theory, just upload some to this web thing um, and play pre-made simulations uh also having live graphs of your macroscopic properties playing alongside but that'll obviously only apply to you know it'll depend heavily on your exact system you're simulating but i think it'd be very useful uh and as i said there's loads and loads of stuff that could be done with this uh i'd actually quite like to implement the thermostat which i showed at the very beginning that that big long um that that ginormous load of code is actually a, a thermostat code that's a bit more 
robust. Um, obviously, it gets more complicated. And those are the types of things I would like to do. So I'd say thank you all for listening to me. Um, thank you as well to people who've seen this before, uh, because I know that I, that I haven't added anything really um, since then, but I hope you still enjoyed uh, watching my nice little videos. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and speak up. I think I'll stop sharing my screen just now so I can sort of see people a bit more. So yeah, thanks very much. If anyone doesn't have any questions, then in a couple of minutes, when that when that opportunity is up, then I guess I'll give it to to, jo to Jake to uh, wrap up if you'd like to. A really silly question: Have you considered funding this by sending by selling some of those animations to the film industry? Because they're wonderful. <laughs> you know what if they'd pay me so that's one thing that i do um think about because i uh, i have a sort of hobby interest in visual effects i, I don't really do any but I, I i follow people on youtube who do a lot of visual effects and so um in that world so so for this stuff it's very much you're looking to as efficiently as possible, um, simulate a physical system so that you can compare it to some actual experiments. Um, things like you've got a block of metal and I'm going to hit it with a high frequency, high power laser, and it'll induce some shocks. And we're going to learn in great detail about how that small bit of material behaves by literally simulating every atom. But when it comes to the visual effects kind of world, you're very much more interested in like how does it look to an audience can we sort of convince an audience that this is water is the, it was the big one for the last what decade or so wasn't it, it was uh, water and, and hairs like on monsters inc right they, they did a lot of work on getting the hairs to look good and you, you don't know as a viewer whether those are like physically realistic hairs but we tend to be quite good intuitively at sort of seeing things and going that looks fake um, and so in VFX, it's, it's very much more on that. So, so that's why, like, for instance, the, that velocity burlet scheme, despite being quite simple, it, it works really well. Um, and it's used a lot in those types of things, game engines and um, the rendering engines and in movies, uh, CGI movies and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, it is. It's very. Yeah, film industry vi visual effects would be fun. But then I would have to write a lot more. C code. I'm not really. I don't really fancy that actually. Does it work in fluid dynamics? Uh, so fluid dynamics, you're looking more towards what's called finite element methods, um, which I don't know as much about. But that's like uh, what are they called? Difference, finite difference, and finite element methods. And it's it's a, it's in a similar regime of things. Um, but your equations are basically slightly different. Like, if you wanted to simulate a fluid using this, it's, I think it's just going to get um, too computationally intensive to be kind of worthwhile. So you use different... All the research there is about... Um, it's a different scale of problem, I think. Yeah, and, yeah most of it's Navier-Stokes equations and stuff like that, but it doesn't cover what happens at the the boundary between the fluid and the solid. No, so... Uh, I'm trying to think, really. Some of these codes do do multi-scale simulations, and it's basically you take a few different paradigms and you glue them together in a, in a physically correct enough way i couldn't give you too many details on that really recently i've been investigating some electromagnetic stuff uh and that falls under a similar thing which is wave equation type stuff um 
Those do overlap. So there are some solid material finite element codes when you're investigating like the stress on an aircraft or you're doing wind and yeah and wind tunnel stuff as well right yeah so they will do fluid dynamics and combine that with some solid uh, finite element stuff. So this exact project as it exists now will not really do uh, good fluid dynamics but it's the the principles same principles kind of apply right. thank you okay cool i think we're done with questions yeah thank you very much richard um that was a great way of kicking us off okay well thank you everybody cheers thank you thank you ray <laughs> all right so long